Good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday. Wednesday, hump day. Yeah, I know that, that commercial still like, what, 10, 15 oh, years old? I still, like still it. Use it. Yeah. <laughs> I still like it. I can't help it. It's dated. I don't care. You know what's not dated? There is a new National League Championship banner being raised. Somebody has won a pennant. Aaron, how you doing this morning? I don't I mean, it's just one of the best nights of my entire life. Um, I was a mess throughout the entire game. I can't even describe the, the ninth inning. Um, I don't know, man. I just, I've watched a lot of Dimebacks games and a lot of them not ended well. A lot of seasons have been horrible. And I don't know if this is just like as good as it gets as a sports fan. And I care about sports way too much. Uh, I know a lot of people watching the show understand that because they're big sports fans too, but I'm not proud of how much I care, but I, I'm proud of this Diamondbacks team. That's for sure. You know, this is this is just nasty work, man. You were <laughs> as a baseball fan, like I, I could picture I was actually watching the game and I'm like sitting there going, Aaron is probably a nervous wreck right now, despite y'all leading six of nine innings, having a lead in six of the nine innings. So, you know, like yeah. if there's ever a thing that just shows how baseball fans are. There you go. Well, there you go. And I mean, that's just credit to the Phillies, right? Because like just any pitch in that park, like it's just I think it's going four fifty. Like when they pitched to Bryce Harper and he took that swing and the ball went to the opposite field, I thought it was never coming back. And it just died on the warning. Well, I, think, track. I like, think everybody in the stadium thought that too. I can't even describe it. Yeah. You, you can only imagine what I looked like. Well, I, uh, I did not, I, I admit, I did not stay up to watch it, but I am excited for you. Congratulations to the D backs and to Aaron. We got ourselves a World Series coming up on Friday, starting Friday. Do we know what time? I'm sure it's going to be like 8, 8.30 something. All the, all, every game's at 7 Central. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, he's already on top of that. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, you need, you need pitching matchups, I guess. <laughs> I, I presume Montgomery, is he going to get the start for the Rangers? I actually, I actually haven't thought about the Rangers because they used Montgomery out of the bullpen. That's what I'm, quite a bit. Of, he got like four innings the other night. <clears throat> Three yeah, that was – so what? That was Monday. Uh, he could probably still pitch. They could go Eovaldi, but, I mean, it'll be Gal and Kelly fought for the D-backs. But, yeah, I guess we'll have to see how the Rangers line it up, whether it'll be Montgomery or Eovaldi first. Well, we'll we'll talk more World Series baseball coming up for yeah. sure because, you know, World Series and, and Texas Rangers in them and uh, some team in Arizona. I don't know. In Pahon- are they in Pahonics? Where, where are they? That's what, I mean, this is how most people are treating them. It hasn't been working out for most pundits yet. <laughs> Travis, I don't want you to uh, say you're going to retire if the Diamondbacks win the World Series like Mad Dog Russo did. So, oh, Lord. Yeah, we that was, we, need, we need a show. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm not Mad Dog Russo in, in, in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And I'm not retiring, so <laughs> no chance of that. You know what? There is a chance we got Specs chat line up and running. Benny Rogers first in the house. Good morning, Benny. We we hope we're going to have a good show. We hope you enjoy it. Already got a question coming in from Sam Man. It's not a super chat, but I'm happy to answer it. The answer is no, Sam Man. We never did hear what it was that had MM uh, Malik Murphy banged up. Don't know. Couldn't have been that serious. He did come in and play. He is expected to start this week. So, you know, we'll – We'll we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. But good morning to the longest horn. Who's got his horns up? That is the name of the show. Get your horns up. Longest horn does it. Colton Bunting in the house. Love it. Max Jefferson in the house. Max, good morning to you too. Uh, Malik and Arch getting ready to lead us to the promised land. We'll see about that too. You know, it's, it's going to be, uh, this is going to be an interesting week. It, it just, from a pure, we have no idea what's going to happen. Like, I mean, we, uh, that's not true. We, we have some ideas. We have some pretty solid ideas. But let, I, you know, let's start with Malik. What, Nash, I wanted to start with you. I noticed you posted a clip of, of his every throw from this season on Twitter, which you can follow Nash at Nash Talks Texas. A good, a damn good fellow. You should be following that. that. Um, what did you see when you when you go through and look at his throws? What do you what do you see from Malik? 
Uh, whew, I see a lot of confidence. Like he, he trusts his arm, but and it's also, it's so far. Granted, it's only like what eight passes, eight dropbacks, or something like that. So far, it's not. It hasn't been a confidence that okay, he's overconfident and not trusting his own. Like you know, it's not like he's forcing the ball into a window that shouldn't be the forced into. Uh, but I feel like we're going to see that. Like you're just going to see that eventually with a guy that with his arm talent. At, even if he's even if he doesn't even if he's not doing that at the very beginning, as he starts to build confidence and stu- starts to do better. He's going to start to try and throw into tiger windows when you got an arm like that and you can zip that ball in there. And he's, there's going to be a throw or two that's going to be dangerous. But to toss it to that point, I'd like, if the wide receivers are having trouble catching uh, bullet passes, I'd like to see some defensive backs do that. But yeah, I, I just, man, I'm, I'm, I really love the confidence that he has. Uh, he's, he's going and he's targeting guys downfield. He's not doubting himself himself at all. But and the, the other thing too is this how quick that ball gets to the wide receivers. Like I talked about it yesterday. I think an un like something that we haven't really thought entirely about is uh the ability of uh as Xavier Worthy to make some moves at, if, if he gets the ball so quickly. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean it's the arm strength is obviously like the first thing that jumps off the page and Nash, yeah, yeah, you completely hit it on the head. Like what I was going to say is like, he just, he has the ability to attempt throws that other quarterbacks just cannot even think about really attempting because he can fit the ball in uh, such tight windows. It'll be interesting because his whole life he's been able to fit balls in the windows and, you know, the defenders haven't been ready. And I, you know, we'll see how many of those he can get away with now that he's, you know, he's obviously taken some college snaps, but this will be his first real start. Um, you know, he's sometimes uh, because you also had every single snap of the uh, the spring game. So I was watching that. Sometimes he'll stare down his receivers just because he can, because he knows he can fit the ball in there. But also, I mean, he has the ability to go through his progressions. I saw him do that multiple times. So it'll be interesting to see what happens when Sark loses the play call, meaning Malik does have to get to his third, fourth read or scramble outside the pocket because he's, you know, he, he can move, but he's not like a dual threat guy. So you know, when Sark wins the play call and someone's open, I don't have much concern that Malik's just going to be able to rip it in there, put it on him, and there's going to be run after the catch opportunity because he does get the ball out. He gets the ball to the receiver so quick. But I'm just interested to see what happens when Sark loses the play call and, like, Malik has to go off script or he has to make multiple progressions because, you know, there will be mistakes, but overall the the arm strength that lets you get away with a lot of stuff is just, you know, he's got to be able to manage it and not get too carried away. Well, and that's the other thing too is like he's you're, you're gonna. I think Sark is gonna limit the reads that he has because you want to like a, a young quarterback too. You want you want quick th- you want quick early passes that you know build the confidence. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that you're gonna see a lot of like one and two two uh, one read two read throws. I, I expect we'll see that too. I, I expect we'll see some slants. We'll see some quick hitches. We'll see. But overall, I'm guessing the game plan is gonna be take deep shots. Because he does hit, he does throw a pretty good deep ball. I mean, yeah, and it, absolutely, you're going to get so, those. And and to your point, Nash, he can create some of the separation with his throws, allowing runners to to you know hit their stride and and take it in their stride, which hopefully will contribute to the yards after catch uh, totals. Well, it's not um, like they're ducks either, too. No, like, no, 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 like, it's, it's, it's a rifle. He's he's got a bazooka arm and he rifles it in there. I, so I think we're going to see some deep throws to to keep the defense honest, but also a lot of the run game. I mean, I, you know, I, one of the best quarterbacks, best friends, period, uh, but especially a new quarterback is a strong run game. So if Sark can soften up, soften up the defense with the deep balls and, and still get the run game going, that is that is the best game script to me that we could see from this offense. Like, if, if that – if those two things happen, there's no reason this team shouldn't roll as roll through the rest of the schedule as long as as long as they're able to pull those two things off. I mean, there's there's nobody left on the schedule that scares you, right? I mean, so no. I, I'm not terribly worried about I mean, that. if anybody, it's Kansas State because Kansas State's kind of pulled themselves together recently. 
And then, like I said, maybe in Iowa State, but that's more, you know, that being a almost like a trap game. Yeah, but Kansas State's turnaround has been on offense. I mean, they, their defense has always been pretty good, but they're not doing anything new there. there it's the offense that is snapped to with Kansas State. So, which, which we'll get into Texas's pass defense coming up here in a minute. But uh, what were you about to say, Aaron? I just I do think it's interesting. Uh, you know, whenever you go into game planning with a backup quarterback, because all anyone's going to say is you got to run the ball. You got to help out your quarterback by running the ball. And, you know, the opposing defense is, you know, I mean, I talked about it yesterday. You know, they're going to want to see Malik Murphy throw the ball. I mean, they're, you sure. know, BYU should load the box. And it's always interesting when you get there because Sark knows in his head, I should run the ball to help out my quarterback. Well, another thing you don't want to do to your quarterback is have put him in second and nine. You don't want to put him in third and seven. And if you run straight into a loaded box on first and second down, Texas might be able to run through a loaded box on first and second down against BYU. But maybe if they can't, then all of a sudden you put Malik in third and long, and that's when it gets tough. So a lot of times, if you can do like a play action bootleg, if you can do easy throws on first and second down, um, you know, that's the way to do it because you get confidence, you get them out of those third and longs. But if they don't work, then you got everyone screaming at you, just run the ball, just run the ball. So it's a delicate balance that Sark has to deal with. Um, I think he'll be prepared for that. But, uh, you know, it's you got to adjust to what the defense is doing, even if it's like backup quarterback got to run the ball. You know, if they have eight guys in the box, you got to sling it. So and, and a lot of me kind of hopes they do stack eight in the box because, you know, the, again, this and that's where you get a if BYU is going to trust their DBs and their safeties or any defense coming up is going to trust their DBs and their safeties to go one on one against Worthy, Whittington, Mitchell, JT Sanders in exchange for stacking eight in the box to stop Brooks and Baxter. I Even with Malik Murphy, even with Arch Manning, I think Sark would take that in a heartbeat. I mean, those guys have the ability to beat them, and 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 both of these quarterback backup quarterbacks have the ability to, to get the ball to them. You know, so, yeah, if, if they come out with an eight-man box, I, I think Sark will gladly take what they're giving them. So, yeah, he, he should be prepared for that scenario. I mean, there's like that's the logical thing that BYU is going to try and do. So Sark, he'll have plenty of play calls ready for this. For this absolutely, and, and we're going to get to BYU in the second half of the show. It's it is Wednesday. We do our scouting report every Wednesday, um, but I did want to talk about Baxter and Brooks. By the way, I mean, we, look, we're we're talking about the run game, and and Houston was a pretty good not coming out party, but Houston was a pretty good day for C.J. Baxter. I mean, he ended up carrying the ball very well. He looks like he's finally starting to get back to full strength, right? And it's so weird. We keep getting the reports that, like, you know, he's still banged up, he's still banged up, and then – but he's still playing all these snaps, and then we watch him, and he looks good. It's like – Yeah, well, I mean, like, that's – he that's looked kinda, really good Saturday, though, and he hasn't yeah. looked that way since the injury. Well, I, I don't know. I, I think you started to see this ever since Kansas. You like you the the problem has been we just haven't seen him for an extended period of time. And like Oklahoma, he was taken out in like the first drive, and I think it's and, and should have been because he was skimpy. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. But like, it's yeah. just I remember versus Kansas, right? Like, I specifically remember watching that. And I was like, oh. Okay, there's there's the explosiveness. Like I like I saw the like I saw the bits and pieces, but like to what you're saying right here, Houston, you saw it like it was like if you didn't see it versus Kansas, it smacked you in the face versus Houston. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. I mean, look, we we've we are all I think all three of us have certainly preseason, I know Nash and I were definitely on board the Jonathan Brooks train, saying he was our guy that we put the flag in the ground for he was you know and and Aaron you jumped on that screen really? really quickly but think about this Jonathan Brooks who is one of the best running backs in the country right statistically the eye test everything that you see out of Jonathan Brooks says this dude is one of the best in the country and yet he got beat out in preseason fall camp by C.J. Baxter. How good is Baxter if he's able to beat out one of the best running backs in the country, a, a, a more experienced running back, to, to become the starter? And we, I mean, I think just, we got glimpses of that against Houston. 
it's I think that I think the answer to that question is that if it, look, if you consider Jonathan Brooks to be the number one back in college football, which I, I mean, that's what I've been that's what I've been pounding the table as saying. And Cedric Baxter is better than that. Then you got to consider Cedric Baxter number one, uh, Jonathan Brooks number two, which would like. But just it, it goes to show, like we just went from a backfield of Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson, one of the best backfields in the country, to Jonathan Brooks and Cedric Baxter. And if Cedric Baxter is healthy and he's looking like that, we've we've just jumped right back to being it, one of the best, if not the best, backfield in the country. I, although I will say Ohio State, man, they got some they got some damn good backs. They have struggled with Travion out. Uh, Travion Henderson, I believe. He, yeah, but Mayan, I'm, I'm, the ball I, I him, would right? like look. I'll say this: if if Mayan Williams is on Texas, I'd have a lot of confidence. Yeah, he's he's a good he's a really good running back. Yeah, I, I mean it, it's a good point with Baxter uh, beating out Brooks. I mean, you know, if there if there's any truth at all to Sark is you know feeding Baxter some of these carries and stuff to make sure they keep him around and keep him involved and make sure he doesn't go anywhere. You know, I mean, I, you, you can kind of see why. I mean, the kid is clearly going to be very, very good. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense. I, and, and to answer your question, Trauma, uh, I do not believe it was a promise to start in recruitment. Um, those things don't work. You know what I mean? If Sark is promising recruits that they're going to start, then he's going to be losing the locker room. I don't think that's happening. I really don't. Well, you don't want to risk I, well, your rep- I think it's you don't want to risk your reputation exactly. recruiting because if you break one promise, word gets exactly. out, and then you don't. Want to- and, I think this is just more of a sort of choices guy. The, like, the this guys is- talk, you know. So like that's going to get out there, and then what do you tell the the guys who have been on the team and playing that they don't really have a yeah. shot to start because he promised some new kid, and and clearly, like we've been saying, Jonathan Brooks is not some schmo. You know, it wasn't like an obvious. Oh, he just got recruited over. I mean, well, and it's it's also important to know that the the coach that recruited Jonathan Brooks isn't at te- he's coaching Temple right now. Yeah. So, and then also on top of that, Jonathan Brooks that was one of the things that like it was a that was a Stan Drayton evaluation. That was Stan Drayton saying, "Hey, this guy's good. We really need to get this guy right. Like he's he may not be a super five star or anything like that, but trust me, he's legit and." Stan Drayton, great running back coach. Charter Choice is a great running back coach, too. He's shown himself to be – it's hard to be the guy after the guy. And he's certainly, you know, filled those shoes and possibly even more. But I just, I think that's all it comes down to is that it, it, Cedric Baxter is uh, to Charter Choice's recruit. Yeah. Like, I don't I, think there – I don't think there's any – I don't think there's any, like, promise or anything like that. It's just – I mean, naturally, you're you're going to be drawn to the dude, the dude that you recruited. Well, not just to chart to Shard Choices recruit. Cedric Baxter was Sark's recruit. You know, he was he didn't recruit Brooks. He put in a lot of effort in the in the uh, CJ Baxter recruitment. And yeah, you're just you're so more invested in those guys. Exactly. So I mean, it kind of makes sense. Plus, I mean, look, that's what we're seeing now. It I think is just the glimpse of Baxter's talent. I mean, we we talked about he looked really good in Houston. And he did, but he wasn't otherworldly yet. I, I mean, he, I think he's got other levels, higher levels to reach that he will get there, uh, especially when given the ball more consistently. And I think that day is coming. But, again, what are you going to do? Bench the guy, who, one of the, the leading rushers in the country, just to just to give a freshman a, the ball? I I think he works well in a tandem. Uh, to, to Nash's point, I, I think Sark managed Bijan and Roshan very well in their division of carries, and and I think we're going to start seeing more along the lines of this with Brooks and Baxter. It could be more of a 60-40, maybe 65-35 split. Um, and more yeah, state, I mean, last more game we had, right last game we had 20 carries for Jonathan Brooks and six for CJ Baxter. I think that's a pretty solid distribution going forward. Then, I think right around there. And then three right. for red too. Save you on red. Keep keep that. Please. Please. Like, they they <laughs> need insane. to I for the life of me, them not running that red zone package against OU is mind boggling to me. Oh, it, it's like we're about OU. It's, All year. Well, it's it's like All the year. Mac. It 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 made me flash back to Mac's days when 
he would hold off and not put in somebody like Cedric Benson until after they lost OU. And then was, then the light bulb came on, oh, I should be using this. And, and next thing you know, said Benson has a hell of a freshman season just because – but it all came like after OU because Mac wasn't trusting him up to that point. It, it, they should have run it in – they should have been running that against – OU for damn sure, if not earlier, because he's a hard well, runner. An and he showed it. He, this isn't new. He showed it in the spring when he was running the yeah. ball in the spring. He was falling forward. He did well in the red zone in the spring. He's a tough runner, which I presume is why they switched him from wide receiver to running back in the first place because of how he ran with the ball in his hands. Well, he also just looks like a running back, too. It's not like it's, yeah, he does. He's built yeah. like a running back. Well, and also early in the year, they had success with the with the Byron Murphy package, which I still love. I'm a big fan of. And then, you know, it, it became City got right on the goal line. I mean, we just need to merge those bad boys, right? Mm-hmm. How about Byron oh, Murphy? Byron Murphy. Who we'll, has called for Byron that at least Tavondre three Sweat, convoy. You put Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat in front of Sabian Rhett, like, good yeah. luck. Good luck. Because first off, it's already a hard task tackling Sabian Red. Like, he's 32 BMI. Like, that. that's just – that is a BMI that does well in uh, football at the running back position. And then when you add on top of that, you got two dudes who are just like – like I, I maintain, Tavon, that was not Tavondre Sweat's fault on the goal line versus Oklahoma. He, he did his job. Yeah, she does. it does remind me of the meme of, of the guy walking with the girl holding hands and then he looks back at the other girl and it's like I'm the so – and it's the – it's the Tavondre well, sweat package, and it's the Savion red package. That, that there's your tweet. But it's uh, just, yeah, I don't like that. That's honestly that meme could be used so much around all the running backs because it's just like there's there's a lot of but hey, it's a good problem to have. Yeah, you know what's not a good problem to have, and and we've got to do we've got to talk about it is the Texas secondary. Um, just going back and, and watching that Houston game more, it was shocking how much not even the crossing i'm not even getting into the crossing the very very easy throws that houston had it just simple pitch and catches because of the cushions that the dbs were giving i mean it it was like they were giving eight yard cushions on a third and two like it's my i don't understand what's going on and it's one of these things that i hope Ryan Watts coming back will help alleviate. Now there's communication issues. I'm not as hopeful that those are going to get fixed until Jalen Catalan gets back. Catalan is still listed as week to week, which means you ain't going to see him this week. Um, so I I don't know how long it's going to be until Catalan's back. I I think yeah I, I don't know. I heard I'm calling out catch here, which is probably on the smart to call out your boss, but like you know he. On his 10 thoughts from the weekend, somebody asked about Catalan. He kind of blew him off like, oh, what has he really done? Catalan's communication is has been critical in the back half of this defense. And that to me is what we're is what Texas is missing. There you can see the mis you can visibly see the miscommunication going on on the field on certain plays. And and you'll see more of that. If you check out my column on orangeplus.com, which will be up later today, and if you're not a subscriber, you should be. But the the Texas secondary has gotten exposed the last two weeks. And and I don't know if it's just a personnel issue, if it's a scheme issue. I, I mean, the cushions, I think, is a scheme issue. It was talked about last year. Sark kept talking about wanting to, to you know play tighter in order to help the pass rush last all last year. I, for whatever reason, this feels like a quirk in PK's defense, and and well, it I, is. That's well, like, yeah. At, at the end of the day, this is how, this is PK's mentality. Is uh, he doesn't he wants to he will not die by the explosive play. Like he will do anything, and it is a bend but do not break. And to the to his credit, you can actually see this. This is one of the hardest teams to score on in the red zone. So like. It, it should make sense, but at the same time, you cannot be allowing these coverage busts to allow these guys to go over the top. I mean, yeah, we talked about it on this exact show. I mean, I remember having multiple rants of, like, the Texas red zone defense is elite. All you have to do is, you know, not let – is not give up explosive plays, make the other team march all the way down the field. 
Um, but it is, it can certainly be a frustrating defensive approach for the fans. Um, you know, it, it happens all the time in the NFL. The main difference has been earlier in the year when I was calling for, Hey, be smart. Just don't allow explosive plays. Teams are not going to march all the way down the field against this Texas team. That was with Ryan Watts. That was with Jalen Catalan. And that was when Texas was getting a better pass rush. They're not getting a better pass rush anymore with just four guys. Um, so that, that changes things because if you're not getting the pass rush before and you don't have a couple of your star players in the secondary teams will march right down the field. If Absolutely. you're playing that, well, um, and- I mean, they will do it, but earlier in the year when everyone was healthy and they were clicking, yeah, you could play those same coverages and teams weren't going to march down the field. And they did. I, they, it's yeah. easy to march down the field when you have an easy pitch and catch for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 yards. And, and Houston yeah. did consistently, especially on third down, the third down defense was, I mean, you would let a team get to third and seven, third and eight. You should not be giving up that much cushion. You should not be giving up the easy pitch and catch. And it was easy. I'm telling you, there was no progression reads for Houston. Donovan Smith didn't have to progress. He had one read the whole time, and it was wide ass open. And it wasn't necessarily anything like a busted coverage. It was the scheme that allowed that player to be open. So I mean it is frustration. And 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 the pass rush does have to get better. And you you wonder if it is now that Burke's injured and how they're going to compensate for Burke. But what do you think, Nash? What is, what's your so thought? I, I think something that's been going on with the pass rush is as we've seen our defensive backs get injured and we see more guys have to go elsewhere. So like for example, this last game, no, I, I know it was just a few snaps, but I mean, really, Jade Barron, it's it sounds like he wasn't even like it does sound like that was a break glass in case of emergency. And yeah. they smashed the hell out of that glass and said, let's get him in as soon as possible while also main, while also keeping Jalen Gilbo getting some snaps. Uh, I, I just, I feel like we're at a point where we're so like, we're running on empty on this uh, depth at the cornerback position. And then also starting to go into the safeties where, when you're having to have Jade Barron play on the cornerback, because like I like I just I feel like we're starting to we saw a lot of these blitzes. Like you see some of these exotic blitzes early on in the year. I feel like as we've had to have some of our depth playing and some of those uh, younger safeties playing, or not younger, but uh, you know backup safeties playing. I feel like we've seen less and less of these exotic blitzes. Like we've seen less <laughs> I, Barron I coming, off of, coming out of it. Third down is when you got to be more creative on defense. Like you were saying, Travis, it's one thing to, you know, be smart on first and second down. But if you have third and seven, you can't just allow them to easily pick it up. So I think third down is when you can increase those exotic blitzes. You can change the look of the quarterback post snap. You can do some of that stuff because, you know, even even some of the great bend don't break defenses, they are known for being very creative on third down, throwing a ton of different looks at the quarterback. So, yeah, I think yeah. that's where Texas probably needs to get more. Third down defense. and and two-minute defense, which is the other area where Texas got exposed in both of the last two games. And, and it is a lot of playing off the ball, allowing more cushion, allowing receivers to, to, to run uncontested. You know, I mean, look, especially if you're going to face an offense like – like a Houston offense, which is predicated on uh, receivers getting, you know, it's it's this West Coast offense. It's the the offense that what's the name likes right. You got it. You've got to put some hands on the receivers. Get them off the rhythm. Contest them at the line of scrimmage. If you're going to play man, and they were playing a lot of man, do don't don't be so afraid of getting beat that you allow yourself to get beat. And, and I feel like that's what's happening is PK is – you're right, Nash. He's trying to keep the big play, the explosive play, from killing him. And as a result, he's getting cut deeply with 10, 15-yard pass pickups because the, the coverage is so soft. And it, it's at special times, you know, two-minute offense, third down, two-minute defense and third downs when it, it's especially noticeable. So I don't know. That's my rant. I'm, uh, I'm, I'll get over it. Hopefully, we'll, hopefully it will. We'll see a better defense cool. against BYU. 
Hopefully, we're going to see if it's Max will get over it. <laughs> hopefully, by the way, you talk about injuries. There's like there's points on last Saturday where we saw Michael Taft, Keaton Crawford, and Jalen Gilbo all on the field at the same time. That's some raw, inexperienced DBs back there. Yeah, I mean, there's like, not enough speed. They they just look slow. We like we literally we were out at there was a point in the game where we were out Ryan Watts, Terrence Brooks, and uh, Gavin Holmes. That's yeah. That's and, not a good point to be at. That's and not, I I hate picking on kids, but frankly, Terrence Brooks being out doesn't worry me as much. He, I the the guy has struggled. I, every time I see someone get burned, I look up and it's number eight. So and I don't know. I I know I shouldn't call out kids like that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm on. I'm just on. I think he's played better. Than I know. I know. We we differ on this. I, yeah. I, I know you're you're more pro Brooks than I am. I. I, I think the guy's getting burned way too much. Um, but, you know, say la vie. We're going to move on. We're going to move on real quick, by the way, to we, – we should have mentioned this earlier when we're talking about Jonathan Brooks, when we're talking about Cedric Baxter, when we're talking about these wonderful running backs, we've got to also talk about elite sports memorabilia. Jonathan Brooks is one of the, one of the first guys to jump on board the ESM train. And uh, we've mentioned this before. There's some merchandise, not a lot, but there's some merchandise from Jonathan Brooks that's still available if you scan this QR code and go check it out. Uh, he's probably going to do another signing, but when that patch comes in, the prices are going up because Brooks is a stud. I mean, there's just no other way to put it. Brooks is damn good, and so he can command more money, and he will get more money. So if you want the cheaper, more not cheaper, if you want the more affordable Jonathan Brooks memorabilia, you got to jump on it right now because it, it that that gear is going and it's going quick. But look, if there's somebody else you want, it's available for you. You've got uh, Adonai Mitchell in the house. You've got Jordan Whittington in the house. You've got Quinn Ewers you know, jerseys. You've got JT Sanders. You've got Tavondre Sweat. You've got Ethan Burke. He who was now week to week as well. I, I still don't know what they're going to do with Burke. I, I'm not, you know, entirely sold on the D line. Burke has been steady. He is not racking up a ton of ton of uh, stats, but he's been steady, and I think he make he helps that defense go. Hey, watch out for watch out for Jamon Tapp. We'll see. I mean, Sark did praise Tap for when he came in after Burke left. So we'll see if he can, if he's ready. Uh, but all of that to say, there's a lot of great memorabilia available at Elite Sports Memorabilia. Go check it out. Do yourself a favor. Do us a favor. Do the players a favor. Go check it out. And while we're at it, it's a game, it's a home game Saturday against BYU. We're previewing the Cougars versus Horns. But you need to start previewing what you're going to be doing for game on Saturday, Saturday afternoon, 2.30. Are you going there? Are you going to tailgate ahead of the game? Are you staying at home and watching? Honestly, sometimes I do prefer staying at home. You, you at least get the replays, and I can cuss out loud without having to worry about, you know, offending anyone near me. So I'm just saying, sometimes the home game is the way to go. Either way, whether you're going or staying – the place you got to go first is Specs. They've got all the fine models. No matter what you're needing, Specs same day delivery can save the day with our Specs app or online shopping. From world class wines to hard to find spirits and craft beers to gourmet foods, delicious snacks, and spectacular sweets. It's Specs. Cheers to savings. I yeah, might have enjoyed that a little too much. I might have enjoyed that a little too much. <laughs> that, that wasn't a pause for a roll, that was a pause to say, you know they've got a lot of good stuff, and I was of which I was about to point out, but that's okay. The specs lady pointed out fine wine, craft beers, spirits, good food. Check out specs. I it's just a, I, look. I wish. I hope. I hope that picked up my laugh that I had. <laughs> it did not when it first happen. <laughs> no, as soon as it started rolling, your muke was muted. So muted. Mike was muted, not muke muted. Uh, anyway, it's time. It's uh, let's let's open up the scouting report. Let's look into the BYU Cougars. Um, 
Steve Sarkeesian's alma mater coming into town. Kalani Sataki, the head coach, those two are good friends. They stay in touch a lot. Uh, Jay Lee, I see your – you know what? Before we – all right. They, oh, yeah, super we'll we'll super chat it. I was going to wait. That's okay. We'll super chat it now. Thank you, Jay Lee. Thank you for the $2. We appreciate it. If you, uh, the rest of you have a question you want answered, Super Chat is the way to go because we're answering Jay's question because he was kind enough to do this for us. So do we consider Quinn Ewers a quote-unquote playmaker? I, I'll i go first. I guess, Jay, it depends on what you define as playmaker. I, I mean, is he? he's not a gunslinger. He's not a... Uh, He's he's not you know if you're looking at the NFL he's not like a, a an Allen up in Buffalo he's not a Patrick Mahomes I honestly I, I tend to think of him more as a a very talented game manager he's got think, the arm to do everything you want him to do he can hit every throw he can he's a smart quarterback. When as he's started to learn the offense, he's really hummed. He's really hitting his stride. I think he is a playmaker in that sense. Is he? Is he? You know, a balls to the wall gunslinger? No, but he's. There is nothing you can ask of of Quinn Ewers that he can't hit on the field, and he started to prove this year. I, I said in yesterday's show, I think he's gotten better every week as the seasons progressed. He's gotten better. I think Quinn Ewers is a damn good quarterback. So it is he a playmaker? I don't know. That's that's up to your definition of what you consider a playmaker. I think I think honestly, man, I think at the end of the day, when like if it's if everything is if if you need a play, right, out of Quinn Ewers, uh, and what I'm talking about is like, I mean, if everybody's covered, if everybody like if the defensive line's getting after him. I don't think Quinn Ewers is going to be the guy that's going to create something from nothing. Right. And that's to me, that's what I consider a playmaker. Right. Like I'm like, I call a playmaker, the guy that it's like, okay, he's screwed. And then, Oh, you weren't screwed. Right. <laughs> like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. But uh, I'll, uh, Josh he's Allen certainly, he's certainly the guy, like you said, right. if it's there, he's going to take it. Right. If it's available, he'll take it. And I think that's where like the game manager aspect, but, I just haven't seen him create like where the wide receivers are covered and he's running behind this line of scrimmage and he just stays, stays long and like a, I hate to say it, like a Caleb Williams type play, you know, like Caleb Williams did to us in the 2022 Red River or 2021 Red River. It, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a pretty interesting one. Uh, thank you, Jay, for the super chat. Everyone watching, please drop us a like real quick. It uh, really helps us out. Uh, you know, we got, we got quite a few people watching, so give us a like, that would, that would be great. Yeah. I, I wanted to say yes when I first read this, because I, I still think he's above the game manager because he can make every throw in the book. He can fit the ball into tight windows. Um, and run. but I, I do agree at the same time, he, you know, he doesn't go out of structure when the play is completely dead, you know, like a Josh Allen or Caleb Williams, um, but he, he still, he can make plays with his legs. Like he's not just like Kirk cousins, just a sitting duck back there. So it, it definitely comes down to your definition of a playmaker. I'm inclined to say yes, because he can make throws that other people can't make, but I can see the, I definitely understand both of y'all's arguments. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, again, I, I think it's reasonable for people to say, oh, he's, he's not a playmaker because of like Nash saying he's he's not the escape artist he's not Houdini he's well, not, it's not even just an escape not, artist it's just like I, no but it's it's the off it's the off book plays you know but it's just it's just like when you need something there right yeah. like like when like hey we we absolutely and here's the deal is it's it's hard to say like 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 you said it's a hard answer to this question because it doesn't mean Quinn doesn't have it, right? Like, like to me, I think one of the, like the thing that you want to, above anything else is just a competitive, like, competitive mindset and competitive spirit. And I think there's no better thing to point to for that than the Oklahoma game, where he started out two picks, and then absolutely just turns it on after that, and he's almost perfect. Yeah, from that point forward. 
Oh, he's he's a competitor for sure. And but but again, that's kind of why I go back to he's a very talented game manager. Like he's going to take what he's given. He's smart. He's got the arm. He's going to do what he can. And and he's not a game manager in the worst sense of the word. Actually, you know, kind of I don't mind a game manager if uh, if if they can make the plays and Quinn can make the plays. So I I mean to some extent that's just being smart. Now he's not he's not gonna get you a lot of the off script stuff. He just isn't. That's not his game. His I liked Quinn a lot by the way when he was tucking the ball and running. Uh, oh, I think that's gone. I don't I, think Starks allowing that ever again. <laughs> probably not. Yeah. But you know, frankly, it. Those extra yards really do matter. I, I don't want a dual threat quarterback per se. That's not what I think Sark wants. But but when nothing is there, I those yards really do count. So excellent question, Jay. We appreciate the contribution. That was a good conversation. I know Benny has our Benny Rogers has already checked in with uh with another super chat, Benny, I'll get to that because it fits in with what we're talking about in the scouting report. And and uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Ted Apar, for letting us know that the Specs gal equals Lisa Reidman. Ridman, Reidman, I'm not sure. Just Lisa. That's fine. I appreciate that. Got to know our sponsors for sure. And thank you for letting us. Uh, I mean, Lisa's a great spokesperson. What can I say? I see her on TV all the time. I, I want to go to Specs when I see very consistent yeah. with their message. Yeah. You know, so I, I appreciate that. But it is time to get into the scouting report. BYU five and two on the season. Not a bad record, right? But when you start to look at who they played, you're like, ooh, that is some super soft scheduling that they've faced so far. And to the point where when I their wins, their their best win so far is over Cincinnati, whom they beat 35 27. Arkansas earlier in the year, they beat 38 31 on the road. And I was really impressed with that until you start seeing what Arkansas is like. And then you're like, um, but, but Arkansas, and I watched quite a bit of the BYU Arkansas game. I watched quite a bit of the BYU Kansas game. I, you know, I've gone back and looked at some of the Texas Tech win last week. I'll say this for BYU they may be five and two against a soft schedule. And, and I'm not sure they're going to win another game. If When you look at who they've got coming up, they've got the real meat of their schedule coming up. I'm not sure BYU gets bowl eligible this year. But they do play with a, a bit of a toughness. There's some real obvious warts, which we're going to get into. But they're not soft. They're not a soft team. Soft schedule, sure. Soft team, no. So they're going to bring something – to Austin, they're going to bring the hits with them. They're going to bring their hats and make sure they get, you know, their licks in. And so this will be a good test for Texas, even if I think Texas out talents them. Nash, I know you were taught, you wanted to mention something about the schedule. I was just going to say, you nailed know, the nail on the head. Their strength of schedule right now is the worst in the Big 12 at 82. Yeah. But they got some Titans coming up in the future. Uh, their, their remaining strength of schedule is one of the toughest in the nation at number five. So. Yeah, Texas Tech on the road, West followed by West Virginia on the road, Iowa State and OU at home, and then a resurgent Oklahoma State in Stillwater. Two top ten teams. It's going to be tough, I think, for BYU to to get into bowl eligibility, to, to get to that sixth win, and they only need one more. So that's that's kind of the team that we're looking at that's coming into Texas. Now, the, the offense is dead last in the Big 12 in yards per game. Keaton Slovis, there was a lot of hype about him coming to BYU, and I've been down on this dude for a long – he is not the answer. Now, we talk about game managers. Keaton Slovis, I, I put in our show notes, he's efficiently bad. Like, he's – nothing on the stat sheet really jumps out at you as like, oh, he's just god-awful. No, 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 he's just – a efficiently bad like he's got like a 56 percent completion percentage he's got 12 touchdowns and four picks but five of those 12 touchdowns came in one game against southern utah again soft schedule the dude is not going to win game even when you when you look at his game by game breakdown it's like 
Slovis for 152, Slovis for 145, Slovis for 167. There's there's only been like two games where he's gone over 300 and one more where he went over 200 yards. I mean, that's it. Four games where he's, his total yardage is in the 100s. This BYU pass offense, we talked about the Texas secondary needing some help, needing to get right. This is a good game to get right with ball. This is one of those where you can put your man, you can man up. You don't need to worry about the big play with Keaton Slovis at the guns. You hear? Are you listening, PK? Don't sell out to stop the big play with the BYU passing game. Keaton Slovis is not going to hit it. Man up, focus on the run game. You're going to be just fine. I promise you. And that, if for no other reason, is why when I look at this BYU game, I don't see how they score. Is Keem Slovis going to lead them to the promised land? What do you guys see when you watch this dude? No, nah, I mean, I I said it last week, right? He's just, he's fancy JT Daniels. Like he's big 12 JT Daniels. That's what it feels like. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at the stats this morning, just like offense, defense, breaking it all down, red zone, third down. And I just like basically got nothing that jumped off the page. Like it's just a very bland team statistically. Um, watched some of the TCU game. There wasn't too much going on there. Yeah, I mean, it just it feels like a game where the Texas defense just has to go out there and execute. Um, I want to see the physicality ran back up for the Texas defense early in the year, man. They were flying around making tackles. Like it was not taking two or three guys to bring down a ball carrier. Um, I think that's what we need to see come back in this game because – BYU just doesn't have that many explosive athletes that should be too hard to get to the ground. So, yeah, I mean, when you look at the BYU offense, it's just it's not that threatening. Um, overall, as a team, like maybe a little bit of Wyoming vibes, like they seem pretty well coached. They get the most out of what they have. They don't have too much. Um, they just kind of go out there and execute, but they just don't have anything to really threaten this Texas team, which is, you know, that's why the spread is what it is. But yeah, not, not, just nothing jumps off the page with this offense, man. It's not like I'm scared of this or I'm scared of that. It's just Texas just has to go out there and play better than they have been, and they're going to be more than fine. Even, yeah, even I mean, playing up to their current level, I think they're going to be more than fine. Sorry, Nash, go ahead. I was just going to say this is just like this is a game that on paper, on fit, like every every word that you look at, and I know this has not been a good uh, thing to say going into games, but this is a game that Texas should just absolutely dominate. And honestly, if we don't dominate, there's probably like I don't, I don't know. There's there's red flags still. But I mean, at the end of the day, if you keep on winning, it is what it is. Uh, but yeah, this is like this is a this is a game that I actually could. If there was a game that they're gonna help be held to zero or negative rushing yards. Uh, this is this is the game uh, for that to happen. I don't. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but this is just of all the teams that we face this year, uh, rushing attack wise. And Rice and Rice was just over one yard per carry. Houston was under one yard per carry. This is. The, I think this team is a worse rushing attack than uh, Rice and Houston. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about the schedule, right? I mean, the schedule has been pretty soft, and they're averaging 2.78 yards per carry. It, like, dead, last. Dead, dead last. Dead yeah, last. Uh, 85 first. rushing yards a game right now. Like, it's like, like – they're not they're not going to run the ball successfully. I mean, they're, they're – it's – I'm looking at the stats right it is It's just horrible. It's pathetic. Uh, 200, I, like, I mean, I'm sorry, but it is what it is. Like, 286, yard, 286 yards a game. That's 123rd in the nation. Uh Yards per play, 117th in the nation at, at 4.5 yards per play. Points per game, 25.3. Uh, now, credit to them, they're scoring more points than Iowa, so I guess there's something. But, I mean, this is just like th – these numbers are something that you'd expect to see from a service academy. Call it. Yeah. Me. Well, except service academies can run the ball, and BYU can't. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, 79 that, yards. option, baby. 79 yards per game is is 130th in the country. They are sandwiched just above Colorado State and just below Vanderbilt. That's the level of rushing attack that we're talking about here. So, you know, I, this is one of those games where I don't think Texas exactly needs to sell out to stop the run. Um, so it's, it's going to be, you know, 
again, I, I don't want to undersell them. I, I, Aaron, I think you make a good point. They, they play with – they're well-coached. They play well-coached football. They just don't have it. Now, I will say, to their credit, they, they rushed the ball better last week. They, L.J. Martin racked up 93 yards on 10 carries against Texas Tech. That included a 55-yard run. Now, Texas Tech's defense is not great. But they did rush the ball better last week, but they're still dead last in the conference and 130th in the country in uh, in rushing. And the defensive side of the ball is not a lot better. They're 11th in the conference at 300, giving up 396 yards per game. They're slightly better rush defense than pass defense, but again, it's not it's not anything that is going to make you, you know, just jump for joy and go, oh God, what is what what has Texas got to do to win this game? Which kind of gets us into Benny Rogers' super chat question. Uh, and and Benny, we'll we'll we're going to answer this right now. Thank you so much for the contribution. We appreciate it. But we're also going to you know break down the game scoring wise tomorrow. But a reasonable amount of let's start with you, Aaron. What what is a reasonable amount of points to expect from the offense with Quinn Ewers out? Uh, well, the BYU games have generally been a little more low scoring. Um, Texas is going to try to probably play smart. I don't think they're going to not going to see too much up tempo with a backup quarterback. So, um, you know, they're obviously going to try to run the ball. We already talked about that, the, the ins and outs of doing that. I think you could still reasonably expect, you know, 24, 27, 31. Like, I think anything below that, you know, would not be a great day. But, um, yeah, from the offense specifically, I mean, I think they should still put up three touchdowns, a couple field goals, four touchdowns. I, I think I don't think that's too much. I'm curious what you guys think. Nash, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I mean, honestly, like, w- that's right where I'm at, Aaron, is we've seen yeah. uh, three touchdowns. Uh, not three touchdowns. We've seen 30 points, and, like, 31 to 38 points has been seven, uh, six out of seven games. The other game is uh, Kansas at 40. So, uh, I, we're living right in that same range. And, honestly – I think that, man, this is just one of those games where I don't – it's very interesting, like, the dynamic, like we said when uh, – like I was saying with uh, Quinn, the uh, yesterday when Quinn Ewers comes back, how does this happen? Because what happens if Malik Murphy just goes out there and we find – like, for the first time all season long, we see this Texas offense just go hang points constantly throughout the game. And it's just it's a massive beat. It's a massive beat down. We've blown out BYU. I just I want and then also and then you go and you do that against Kansas State as well. I think that question of Malik Murphy, you know, it, if the offense is performing a lot better with Malik Murphy in, I, I think that there's just there's a lot more question. Like there's 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 more there's more problems that it be get, end up being created. Uh. But that to to what I'm saying, man, I really I can see uh, I can see a situation where we go out there with Malik Murphy, and we are getting these deep passes. He's executing like he's just like I, because here's the deal, man. Like I'm just to me, it's that confidence I was talking about earlier. He I I think he just has a little bit more confidence in Quinn Ewers and his ability to. I, I like I don't. It's not more confidence in his arm because they both have great arms and they can both put the ball in anywhere on the field. But I think for Quinn, it's just more of a he doesn't want to have that bad play, whereas Malik's just not afraid of it. I don't know. That's that's just my general vibe that I get. Well, yeah, that's fair. That's, and and I that's think, interesting. Yeah, I I think look Quinn. I mean, Malik has ultimate confidence in himself. Which is one of the reasons why every time someone talks about Malik, he should have transferred or, you know, we got to worry about him in the portal. Oh, he's, you know, now that Arch is in, is Malik going to – Malik trusts himself. And he doesn't stick around without trusting himself. The dude knows what he can do. And and I think he's eager to show it. And to answer your question, Benny, I think 30 is the bare minimum. I, I think that – that benchmark will a be more than enough to win, but also to their point, that's where Texas has been living this year. Now, 
if if Nash if Nash, you know, if that hypothetical plays out, as Nash pointed out, where they do hit some big explosive plays through the deep balls, which opens up some big explosive run plays, you could see it's it's not out of the realm of pot. It's, it's not at all crazy to see Texas putting up 40 to 50 on, on BYU. Honestly, this defense is that bad. Uh, they're tough, but they're not good. They don't have the speed to hang – with the, the Texas wide receivers. I don't think they have the speed to hang with the Texas running backs. I think Texas' offensive line will be just fine Saturday. You know, so 30 is the minimum. 50 is not out of the question. And at the very least, for what I was saying, I want to get Aaron's uh, thoughts on what I said because he looked like he had some uh, good thoughts going on yeah. in that brain. But, uh, man, like, to what I was saying is, I, I think that this is a situation where with, like, at the very least, what you have, if what I said happens, you know, we're out there hanging 48, 50 points, 60 points, whatever. Although I don't think we're going to get 60 points. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Unless the other team dictates it, we're like, we have to score that to win. Uh, but I just, man, I, at the very least, what, what Malik, if Malik Murphy plays well, what we're going to be able to do, it's going to allow the Texas coaching staff to say, okay, you know what, Quinn, you get fully healthy before you come back. But I want to hear Aaron's thoughts on this. I think that's what it is. I think I think it would be huge if Malik can be good enough for them to say, we do not have to rush Quinn back. In the other scenario, which you hinted at a little bit, where Malik is so good, it seems like another element of the offense has been unlocked, where it's like maybe this should just be the guy. I... I just have a hard time seeing that happen. Um, we've talked about it. We don't have the all 22 films, so we can't look at, you know, every single decision Quinn Ewers made and whether he's making the right reads or not. But I will say we're all talking about three, three, five, three, three, five teams are playing the passing game. Like they're not going to let Quinn Ewers beat them over the top. That's why we've seen less deep balls. If Malik hits a couple deep balls, it's pro I think like a big part of it will be because, you know, teams are stacking the box and they're making Malik beat those deep balls. Quinn is, has the respect of opposing defenses to where, I don't know, I would be shocked if we're sitting here um, and it's in a couple of weeks and it's just like if we're having a Malik versus Quinn debate. I, I think Quinn is the guy. No, I'm not expecting um, that either. And you know what? Yeah. Jay Lee checking in with the super chat. He's not expecting that kind of blowout either. Saying $5. Thank you again, Jay. We appreciate the support. Saying, I don't care. Oh, and and thank you, Benny. We appreciate your support too. Yep. Say it, Jay. Saying I don't care who our quarterback is and who we're playing. He will absolutely be shocked if each of our last games do not come down to the last possession. I mean, that's not even a Malik Murphy or a Quinny Ewers take. That's just like a battered down Texas fan that's, syndrome, which I completely understand. I I completely get. Listen, it. Jay has been on this. Uh, Jay and I chatted before, and he's his points. The the concerns he raises are legit. Um, and, and we've all talked about them as well. You know, the, the, the red zone, the third down offense, the, the, the passing defense, which popped up the lack of a pass rush. Jay has legitimate reasons for being pessimistic and, and it showed in OU, for instance, it showed against Houston. So certainly Jay, I, I'm not, I'm not dismissing you, but I, I think I will be shocked if each of our last games comes down to the last possession because while BYU schedule only gets tougher from here on out, Texas gets a little softer from here on out. You know, there, there's no more uh, Alabama's on the schedule. There's no more OU's on the schedule until Austin, until Dallas, Arlington. So I, I will be shocked by that. I will be shocked if this is a one possession game on Saturday. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the Kansas State game is probably going to get sweaty. I mean, that's what I'm expecting. But, yeah, this game, yeah, I mean, I would be surprised. But I know everyone's going to be out there saying, oh, man, these guys said the same thing against Houston. We did. And they are correct. Yeah, I mean, and that's true. This is just this is just part of football. Like, Texas, you know, Vegas, they don't make these spreads just on a whim. Like, the spreads are no, very it, accurate. There's money. Reason. There are people that do not like – look. Yeah. The people that are determining these spreads, right – they don't like losing money. They don't. No, I mean, and, the, the and they're, they're pretty. They, they honestly. And here's the other deal too. These are the type of people that take offense to losing money when they get when they get it wrong. Like they get they don't 
they don't like getting the uh, score spreads wrong and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's all numbers too, but I mean, yeah, I mean, we said it all last week, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think the only way BYU stays in this game and this is going to sound like generic football analysis, but I mean, it's just going to be Texas has to turn the ball over two to three times and it just has to be disastrous miscommunication in the secondary, which I mean, the Texas secondary has been kind of disastrous lately, and they do have a quarterback making his first legitimate start. So turnovers are a possibility. So yeah, I, I guess that is that is the story for a close. I game. was going to say so. To, you know, to, to pose the question, how does BYU win? Like when you look, go back and look at, for instance, the summary on ESPN after they beat Cincinnati, which I think I, I, Cincinnati's not a wonderful team, but they're not bad. I'll give them a little credit for beating Cincinnati. But the summary was, quote, the Bearcats had early success moving the chains with their rushing attack. Cincinnati racked up 154 rushing yards by halftime. Finishing drives proved to be problematic. That's like how BYU wins the game. If Texas has problems finishing drives, which, you know, we've seen that. Well, it's, it's if Texas gives them a short field because they're not going to be able to run the ball, so they're not going to be well, able to. Well, yeah, that's it's I the combination. Think. If Texas gives the BYU offense short field and Texas's offense itself struggles to finish drives, that's how – because they're going to – again, they're going to play tough. This is a tough football team. They're not they're not pushovers, right? You don't go into and, – and that's physically and mentally. By the way, I know Arkansas is not a great team, but you don't go into Fayetteville and come back on the road and win unless you're you've got some mental toughness to you. And so, I will I'll be honest, I will lose some mental toughness or uh, I might actually gain some if we if we win, but uh if we are in a close game versus Texas Tech, <laughs> no. I would let, let's, I mean, let's just blow, chat. if there's one game, if I have to choose one game where we get to blow the blow the other team out Make it Texas Tech where Brett Yormark he has to he has to hold that L with uh probably probably not gracious. He probably won't do it with grace, but you know, he's gonna have to take that L and you know it it'd be nice if Texas wins the either way, if Texas or Oklahoma wins the Big Twelve championship where he has to just sit there with some fake smile or he, he pretends that he, he's happy, that that'd be like a nice little final send off. I mean, this chat from Lane, uh, yes, you are correct. I, I have no rhetoric. It's a great chat. Um, yeah, I mean, it's I, I, I get it. I, I get it, Lane. So, yeah, that's or, a good point. Or this one from Max, we don't have our starting quarterback. That's true, Max. But what I'm telling you, what we've been saying, what we're trying to get across to you is Texas's quarterback depth, while inexperienced, is still really damn good. There's a lot of teams that would love to have Malik Murphy stepping in as their quarterback to start, much less as the backup. I'm just telling you. And, and they're still favored by 18. And I they're mean, still Vegas favored. is aware yeah. that Quinn Ewers is not playing. It, <laughs> it's not exactly crazy that we're coming out here and saying Texas should not struggle with BYU. Go look at BYU. That's what we've been trying to point out to you, Max. BYU is not a good team. BYU struggles to run the ball. BYU struggles to pass the ball. BYU struggles to stop the run. BYU struggles to stop the pass. Where? How do they win this game? How do they score? If Texas doesn't hand it to them, how does BYU score? This, this is not a good team. So I, I understand the consternation. I understand the PTSD from, from, from all of you out there. I get it. Oh, it's fair. It is so fair. I'm not discounting it. I'm just telling you. You're giving it too much weight. You're giving into your concerns a little too much. Like, like I'm not even saying they're wrong. I'm, just I'm not saying, saying like, they're wrong either. Our, I'm just saying, I'm saying when we're doing our analysis. Like you know, we're going to say what we see, and this is what we see. I'm just saying exactly. I'm just saying there's. This is not a team that you. I don't think you should be stressing about this team. Not saying you're wrong about Texas's problems. We've talked about them ad nauseum. But. BYU's got more problems. So, and 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 at the end of the day, as Nash likes to point out, Texas is still six and one. So, it do I struggle with it too? But you do have to enjoy the ride sometimes, guys. We we do hope maybe you enjoyed bumpy. this. Do what? I said it may be bumpy. It's like a for any of those that ever went to it. 
it's like the Six Flags, the Rattler, Six Flags. Uh, the the old one before they fixed it up, when you basically got a concussion every time you ran, ran, rode on the thing. Excellent point. Or it's like the uh, the movie from the late '80s, early '90s, Parenthood. Anyone ever either of you seen that? I, I think I've, I, I, I I I I know what you're talking about. Steve like, Martin. Be one of those if I saw it. I think I'd. Yeah, Steve. There's a scene at the end where the grandma is talking about life is like a roller coaster. It's a fantastic movie. I know you haven't seen it, Aaron, but that's okay. Check it out. Steve Martin. Steve Martin. He's the one with uh with all the kids in the other movie, right? With like Steve just a the ridiculous amount of kids. <laughs> I like is that. that him? Che- yes, Wait, che- you don't know who Steve Martin is off the top of your head. No, he he knows. He knows who Steve Martin is because he just he just said the movie. But cheaper by the dozen. That's one of that is a classic. Okay, so I've got the right guy. Pitched yes, in yeah, my the, head. the white hair, white hair, hilarious yeah, okay, dude. That's a W for me. And hey, you know what? His range, man. He's got some range. <laughs> I just and and a damn good banjo player. In case you didn't know. All right, guys, that's it. We do have to run, yeah. <laughs> but we appreciate you watching. Hope you've enjoyed this show. Hey, Benny asked us to have a good show. We hope we delivered. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button. It helps us out. And do yourself a favor. Subscribe to the channel because there's a lot of great Texas football talk coming up, starting with Anwar's Old Fashioned Sports Show next, followed by House Divided with Jeff Ketchum and Chad Hastings, followed by Football with Friends this afternoon with Alex Dunlap breaking down the defense uh, after having put out the deep dig on Orange Bloods, followed by OB Outsiders. It's Wednesday. It's it's Survivor Night, so of course it's OB Outsiders Night. That's 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 the trick that Aaron gave me that I do I I can relate to. Oh yeah, that's right. It's on solid season Survivor, by the way. I mean, watch the OB Outsiders, but uh, Survivor's pretty good. This uh, it's very good. I'm I'm always a fan, and uh, never. And I, I felt bad for that Lulu tribe just getting decimated, but you know, it's pathetic stuff. It, it was truly pathetic, but but. <laughs> They're still alive for now, three of them. So we'll see two of them. Anyway, guys, that's it. Well, three of them, actually, because the last, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Survivor recaps on Thursday. We'll just boot Kyle Aggie <laughs> back Thursday. We'll just make a Survivor segment. Everyone will love that. I hope the rest of your day is as good as Aaron's night was last night. I hope you have that same that's euphoric feeling yeah. for the rest of the day. Have a great day, everyone.